Okay, everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Murphy uh, from the Politics in the Pub Committee. I'd really like to welcome you all here tonight for the final uh, session of our program for 2016. And um, we have a really uh, profoundly important uh, topic for tonight. Is public science being destroyed in Australia? Um, before I get into that, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight. That's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation pay respect to their elders past and present and to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people, especially uh, here in the audience tonight. Um, I'm uh, myself really uh, proud that Politics in the Pub is, is putting on this session. CSIRO is uh, something we all do know about. It's a really, really valuable agency that's been growing up over many, many decades in Australia. Um, and there are many other uh, agencies of public public sector agencies involved in science which we don't know so much about or they're not so prominent all affected by what we're going to talk about tonight so I've got two fine speakers for you unfortunately uh, Robin Williams who would have loved to have been here I went through all of the agony of getting him to agree to come and he was on the program we printed it and then the National Geographic Australia decided to give him an award tonight so so I said, OK, <laughs> no, he had to go there. And uh, so he sends his apologies. And um, you know also of his stature in this debate too. So it's uh, really important to, to realise how significant uh, people feel about this topic. So the speakers tonight, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Borges and uh, Dr. Yalchen Oitem. So Dr. Michael Borges grew up in Port Augusta He's a big supporter of the repowering of Port Augusta solar initiative, a solar initiative. And uh, he's amazed by the sustainable production of 15,000 tonnes of tomatoes for Coles supermarkets at the innovative Sundrop Tomato Proprietary Limited at the top of Spencer's Gulf in an arid zone. So uh, from an early age, he was attracted to maths and science. Uh, and he has the combined influence of living in the outback, the sea nearby, Cracker Night and the Playford Power Station pollution to inspire him. Uh, he's got degrees in Applied Mathematics from Adelaide Uni and a PhD in Applied Mathematics from, and Theoretical Physics from the University of Cambridge in the UK, uh, where he was a member of Trinity College and, and in the team recently uh, highlighted in the movie The Man Who Knew Infinity. His work on free surface flows and air and blood flows led to postdoctoral work on the mechanics of lungs and respiration at Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, he joined CSIRO in 1987 and, and uh, working in the Division of Atmospheric Research, now the Oceans and Atmospheric Business, business Unit. Um, he became an expert in geophysical fluid mechanics, turbulence, flows of chemicals and particles for environmental application in air pollution and odour perception, in the atmospheric surface layer and in the ocean. His work has ranged over transport and mixing, including working with the Bureau of Meteorology scientists over many years, most recently in the Centre for Atmospheric Weather and Climate Research. He collaborates with researchers and students in universities in Australia and overseas. Uh, following in the footsteps of the famous Trinity College mathematician, cricket aficionado and trade union leader G. H. Hardy. Michael is very active in the trade union movement, the CSIRO Staff Association, uh, including giving a seminar, a seminar on the novel Oceanic Bubbles at 2 a.m. in the 1993 work-in dispute um, to, the current, uh, to his current role as president since 2001 and a CSU governing council member. This Interesting and turbulent era in CSIRO includes leading negotiating teams for bargaining for four enterprise agreements, running industrial disputes and fair work cases, and high level representation of staff issues in CSIRO with strong commitments to staff, career, science and science integrity issues. He has influenced leaders in the broader trade union movement, science, industry lobbying groups and political parties, and has regularly interacted with the media over several decades. Along with many prominent climate and environmental researchers, Michael is currently targeted for redundancy in the current round of cuts in the CSIRO. 
Our second uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Yalchen Oitem. He was born in Cyprus and moved to Australia when he was 15. He studied electrical engineering at the University of New South Wales and after a few years of industrial experience returned to complete a PhD in neuroengineering. This is a computational study of animal cognition. He has publications in applied mathematics, computational biology, experimental psychology and the philosophy of cognition. More recently he developed new mathematical methods and released software for analysing modern genetic data sets and other types of big data. Yelchin has a keen interest in social and political sciences, in particular the interaction between science and socio-economics. He sees human capital as the true wealth of a nation and science as a fundamental part of creating human capital out of transient resource wealth, diversifying and enriching the Australian economy as well as providing access and opportunity for all Australians. He, is a state, he was a state councillor for the CSIRO Staff Association and is also a supporter of Friends of CSIRO and it's through the Friends of CSIRO which we made the invitation to Yalchin. So please welcome him to the microphone. Thank you very much and thank you for being here. I can see a few um, friendly faces already and some new ones obviously. Um, what I would like to do today, I'll I'd like to start off by trying to give you a, a, a broad context for the social function of science. The impact it has on the economy, the impact it has on, on culture, on, on political awareness, essentially the impact that it has on life as we know it, as we lead it, um, the, the, the potential that it creates for the, the human interaction with nature. So I hope by the end of my talk you will understand that more or less, the, a government's attitude towards humanity in general can be tested by their attitude towards public science. That what is good for public science is good for humanity in general. And whenever there's a deviation from that, I'll try and point out to you that perhaps it's an indication that the government or the social order is not about doing what's best for the common good for all humanity, but what's best for a certain certain sort of economic tribe, let's, let, let's say, which is the root cause of all tribalisms, racism, gender politics, and so forth. So this is what I'm trying to, uh, this is what I'll try and achieve today. And as I talk about the important science, rather than debate whether public good science is under attack in Australia or not, to me it's an open and shut case that it is. In fact, I asked a friend of mine, uh, for some advice about my talk, I said, what would you say? And um, this guy who's, who's an absolute polymath, <laughs> um, he said to me, well, I would go to, get up there and I say, I would say I rest my case and I would sit down again. <laughs> so it's not, it's not much of a debate, but as I talk about the significance of science, I will point to what has been done right historically and what has been done wrong more immediately and more locally in Australia. And I'm sure my um, esteemed colleague, Michael, will give you a lot more detail about the specifics of um, science governance, whether it be from a government perspective or from uh, potentially, without putting words in Michael's mouth, um, the managerial attitude from within CSIRO. Um, first of all, um, <coughs> Let me start by saying, stating an obvious that Australia is a resource resource rich country, and in recent history it has had a I mean it's a relatively rich country. But one thing we know about resource wealth is that it is transient. It creates a certain economic activity, but it needs to be capitalized upon to make the benefits of resource wealth into something that's more tangible, something that's longer term, something that is sustained. And to me, I would think of resource capital as a potential to create human capital. And by human capital, I mean human know-how, maximization, capitalization, or optimization of the truly limitless um, um, resources that we have, which is human creativity and human imagination. Capitalizing on these things to create um, economic, cultural, uh, and political benefits. So let's start with, um, I'll try to make a case as to why 
countries with human capital do better than countries just with resource wealth. Um, think of Germany, think of Japan. They're not particularly rich in anything of natural wealth, resources, and whatnot, but they, they have been doing consistently well. You could include France in that. Um, going down the scale of um, health, wealthy, successful countries, look at the Middle East. The, the, um, the biggest economy with the, the most vibrant, vibrant economy in the Middle East at present does not export a drop of oil or any gas, and I'm talking about Turkey. Probably a bad example to give at this point in time, given what Erdogan is doing and that sort of this repressive regime that's emerging in Turkey that hasn't been seen since, since, um, since Ataturk died, basically. Uh, um, so um, there is one exception to that rule. I mean, there are some countries that are resource rich and do well in terms of um, um, quality of life metrics, more general metrics, notably Norway. But the Norwegians have got an admirable policy, conscious and admirable policy in translating resource wealth into human capital. And not just for themselves, but for the poorer, poorer nations as well. Going further down the, the, the rung, I mean, you could, you could definitely argue that if you were to live in a fairly poor country, you would want that to be Cuba and not, say, um, you know, El Salvador or something like that. So, it, it, so I, I hope that I've, I've just made the case about the importance of creating human capital, going from transient wealth into human capital. So how does, I'll touch on it again, but let's move on to the, the, the role that science plays within this. Why is science important? Well, you take an economy like Australia's economy, top heavy about resources and maybe banking, what would science do? Science that is well managed would take those resources and translate them into new economies, diversify the Australian economy, enrich it through manufacturing, through doing things that we couldn't imagine. We, I, I mean, the potential of science is that it can create a new sort of um, array of industries 10 years, 20 years from now that we can't even imagine or think of today. It is the, the scientific history, the interaction of science with the economics is full of examples like this. I mean, think of the mobile phone industry, for example. Think of this digital disruption and all talk about digitization of the economy. These things, it's pretty hard to, to, to control or, or predict the kind of impact science is going to have in terms of what new industries will, will emerge. But one thing you can predict is that if you invest in science, you take what the, the current wealth that you're getting today in today's economy and you open up absolutely new vistas, new um, engaging, interesting jobs um, that, that basically come out of, um, it seems, nowhere rather than just being some sort of a um, deducible, um, logical endpoint of the current economy as you know it. So. Um, that's the, the scientific, um, the, the value of the, you know, science in terms of the economy, but it, it, it goes beyond that. Um, so if you're investing, uh, you're also future-proofing the, the, the economy by um, investing in this creative resource that is the, the human capital. The, uh, there's one other thing that science coupled with public, good, I mean, public education can lead to, and that's social equality, improved social equality, and social mobility. These are not just good ethics or just good sort of, shall we say, humanitarian values, but the, the, they're also fundamentally important for the economy itself. And I've got a very nice report here from the, the hotbed of Bolshevism, that is the IMF, okay? And I'm just gonna, if you allow me, I'm gonna read to you the opening paragraphs from this. And it says, widening income inequality is the defining challenge of our time, says the IMF, who probably contributed to that widening inequality more than any other organization. But it's important that they acknowledge that. In, uh, um, in advanced economies, the gap between the rich and poor is at its highest level in decades. And that's probably true. Um, if you want to see the, the <laughs> levels as high as this, you would probably want to go back to the 
post, post-war Europe. Um, first, they say, we show why policymakers need to focus on the poor and the middle class. Earlier IMF work has shown that income inequality matters for growth and its sustainability, purely economic values. Our analysis suggests that the income distribution itself matters for growth as well. Specifically, if the income share of the top 20%, the rich, increases, then GDP growth actually declines over the medium term, suggesting that the benefits do not trickle down. So trickle down <laughs> politics don't work. Right. In contrast, in an increase in the income share of the bottom 20%, the poor, is associated with higher growth, higher GDP growth. The poor and the middle class matter the most for growth via a number of interrelated economic, social, political challenges, every single one of which benefits from an investment in public good science and investment in public education. How does that happen? What is, what's, <laughs> what is this social mobility? But they define social mobility in terms of people being able to be engaged in life in creating wealth in manners that are not dependent upon how rich their mummies and daddies were, right? Um, so what does science do? Imagine um, good, sound uh, policy on public good science coupled with public education, okay? You are creating the basis for every child that comes into this world to, to, to optimally contribute to the human capital, to be a part of it, and to benefit from it. So. Um, Public education gives them that entry point. And if you have public good science, you're continuously inventing new ways of creating wealth, economic activity, engagement with, with nature. And more to the point, I mean, learning and, and, and making more sophisticated the ways humans interact with nature. I mean, that's fundamentally what, the, what, what defines the quality of life for all of us, OK? So there, there lies the benefit of public good science right there. Um, if you couple that, the public good science, public education, with a certain amount of public ownership of what's being created, public ownership of the new industries, then you really are solving the problem of inequality, the problem of um, reduced mobility, and you're contributing not only to the improved status of the economy, you're contributing to averting crises, political crises, and should those political and economic crises emerge, and I'll give examples about that, the cultural endpoint of science or the cultural benefit from science, rationalism, um, objectivism, being able to look at a, an event and studying it objectively, may, making decisions, would help you get out of the tr problem that you're in. It will make you less amenable to political opportunism. So at this point, I think it's probably important to give some tangible examples from history at this point in time. Um, there was a nice graph here um, of countries of a study done in 2013, and they basically take a, a number of representative countries from all the rungs of socioeconomic development in the world, and they show, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but I'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. So basically, there, there is an increase since the 1980s, there's an increase in inequality and a reduction in mobility in all the countries studied, even the Scandinavians, right? But they are at the bottom of the plot. So it's a linear plot like that. Okay. Scandinavians are at the bottom. The two countries that lead the pack in terms of inequality and reduced mobility and you would guess it, judging by the, the political nature that they're there in, United States and the UK. So Brexit and Trump, right? So, so basically, the very policies that they've been championing, you know, trickle-down politics, tax breaks for the rich, <laughs> all the things that, according to IMF, probably the champion of trickle-down politics, is telling you it's getting in the way of economic growth, getting in the way of stagnation leading to immobility and inequality are the countries that where you're seeing Brexit, okay, basically <laughs> if there was a um, sort of national self-harm, if there was ever sort of an act of self-harm at a national level, that would be it. And secondly, Trump, which not only is a risk for the United States, but for 
basically for world peace in general. What, what has led to this? I mean, I mentioned briefly the policy that has led to this, but in, in conjunction with this, there's been a divestment from public good science. So they've, they've um, led the grounds for this to happen, which could have been averted, would have been averted by, I would argue, a healthy investment in public good science and a healthy investment in education to counteract these, the, 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 the factors that lead to the crisis point. Secondly, um, what is the basis for Trump? I mean, let's, let's think about Trump for a minute. There's a whole bunch of angry Americans who, have, who are suffering from, the, the, from what is captured by the statistics, increased inequality and you know, lack of mobility. They're angry about these things, but what do you do? They turn to a politician that only promises to do more of what led to the state they're in. Okay, so it's it's basically people who are suffering from <laughs> um, a particular problem acting in ways that only make that problem worse. Science, social science in particular, I mean, and the influence of it offers a a um, an insurance against this. I mean, if you know. You, you can sit up here and, 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 and give an analysis of the process that has led to this and, and through scientific reasoning and evidence you can argue that Trump wouldn't be a good idea, right? In general, I mean, you can use science, a healthy public good science that sort of becomes culturalized gives that resilience to any democracy. It has, an, has a positive impact on any democracy. It, it, it strengthens you against the influences of the murder press. Okay, this is by what I mean. This is what I mean by public good science shaping the culture in such a way that will um, minimize, if you like, political opportunism in the way that we see it. So, I think I've um, said mostly what I wanted to say about that at that global level. So, I'd like to sum this up by saying this part of it, um, by saying that given the the broader impacts of science. As I said at the beginning, if you really are about what is best for humanity, what is best for everybody, you would not walk away from investing in public good science, just as you would not walk away from investing in public education, which has been happening consistently in the West, especially in the um, Murdoch-influenced West, shall we say, more than any other part of the West, um, well, you wouldn't do, do these things. So why are these things happening? They are happening because the political agenda is being dominated by a small tribe, a small economic tribe who are only interested in the short-term gains and they've been progressively blind to what's best for their longer-term interests and certainly what's best for humanity. Leading policies that, 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 that leads to crises, and, and at this point I would say things like Brexit, things like Trump, thing, things like the emergence of um, you know, potential right-wing moods in Europe um, <laughs> should be a warning signal for all of us that time is about right for, <laughs> for us to, to sort of resist against that. I am not for a minute saying that it's, it's, it's all negative. I mean, there's also the Bernie Sanders effect. You know, Americans, there's the other side of the Trump equation. At this point, I would like to sort of quickly move from that and try and discuss more immediate stuff as to what would a competent government interested in engaging public good science, what would you do? How would you run it? And what, what has happened? So I talked about resource wealth and I talked about um, proceeds from resources. Australia saw a massive windfall in the late 90s, early 2000s, and for a, for, a, for a very lengthy period of time, there was a lot of wealth coming in. So let's ask ourselves what Australian governments did with that money, in particular um, the Howard governments. They took that money, did they invest it in ways that would lead to, um, did they invest it in um, public good science which would then lead to economic outcomes, positive economic outcomes, the answer is no. They, they did, you know, um, tax breaks, tax concessions, tax reductions, and at a time, which is very sad to say, when they were getting the most amount of money from the resources, they divested from, say, solar energy in around early 2000s, which, which 
saw Australia lose its advantage, its global advantage in solar energy, and most of that work, um, you know, UNSW was involved, basically moved to, to China. So Chinese um, companies benefited from that as a result of that. Um, more sort of microcosmic, but sort of relevant to, to me and Michael was um, we had a site at North Ride, for example, a purpose-built site for scientific, for um, laboratory science, essentially. I think finished officially in 2000, 2000. By 2003, under John Fay's direction, it was sold. And that money went into general revenue, and CSIR didn't see any of that. And what we did, we continued to use that site, but we ended up renting it from the people who bought it. And over the years that we have been renting it, we have probably returned all of the money that we got out of them, and now we don't have a lab. So that short-sighted decision, and there are many of these, I'm just giving you just one, led to science being expensive at North Ride, and an endless sequence of redundancies to deal with the costs. So, um, <laughs> it doesn't really, um, well, what more can I say? I mean, that's just clearly that, that sort of short-sightedness, that ideology that leads to um, a reduction in scientific sort of practice at a microcosmic level. So, um, Michael will talk more about that. I'll let him do that talking. But what I'd like to say today is that um, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll borrow um, Rumi's famous line, whoever you are, come. So basically, if you're interested in a progressive Australia, one that um, plays a positive role in the world, if you're, uh, if you're interested, and we all are, I hope, um, you know, throwing tasks to our children and grandchildren, more along the lines of the Peter Singer challenge, finding ways and means of not only doing the right thing by all humans, but finding ways and means of passing on person rights and human rights to animals, instead of their challenge being how to survive in a Mad Max type <laughs> sort of mess, then this is the time that we take public good science and public edu education seriously. This is the time that we rally behind it, and whether it, I mean, through either existing political parties or beyond them, we find a way of champion this, engage the society, and champion for these things. Because, as I said, um, if um, the attitude towards public good science is basically equivalent to attitude to what is best for humanity. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all and pass the um, microphone to Michael Borges.